Morning, everyone. You're welcome to Bible study. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we purpose to rejoice and be glad in it, regardless of what the enemy wants to say or do. This is I Believe Bible Fellowship. We're in Houston, Texas, and we're a bunch of believers who love the Lord unashamedly and unreservedly. We study scriptures verse by verse because the Bible says line upon line, precept upon precept. What pastors do on Sunday is great. They take a piece of scripture, they put a sermon together, you learn the lesson, but you still do not know the book. You must know the word of God. So I'm grateful that God set us up this way to learn the word line upon line, precept upon precept. We let scripture interpret scripture here, not anecdotes, not stories, not examples from anyone's life other than the lessons God wants us to learn from the lives of these people who either work, walked with him or did not walk with him. And since we've been doing that for almost five years, we've seen growth, we've seen depth, we've seen God move tremendously in our lives. This is our second go round. For those of you who are just joining us, you're very welcome to this fellowship. This is one place that I can guarantee you that you will grow and you will know the word of God. Uh, we are currently in the book of 1 Kings, and uh, if you're just joining us, I want to invite you to give God a minimum of two years in this fellowship. It takes two years to go through the entire Bible, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. After two years, if you feel you've grown and you know all that you need to know, you can leave and go and impact lives for God outside there. I believe the church should have revolving doors. Jesus Christ said, go ye. He didn't say sit ye. Right? Praise God forevermore. We stopped yesterday at 2 Kings 13. And uh, we're picking it up from chapter 14 this morning. So without further ado, let's jump into it. 1 Kings 14. At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself, that thou be not known to be the wife of Jeroboam. And get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is Ahijah, the prophet, which told me that I should be king over his people. And take with thee ten loaves, and cracknels, and a cruise of honey, and go to him. He shall tell thee what shall become of the child. And Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose, and went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were set by reason of his age. And the Lord said unto Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, For it shall be, when she cometh in, that she shall feign herself to be another woman. And it was so when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door, that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why feignest thou thyself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. Go, tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, For as much as I exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel, and rent the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it thee, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, and who followed me with all his heart, to do that only which was right in mine eyes but has done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and has cast me behind thy back. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man taketh away dung till it all be gone. Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. For the Lord hath spoken it. Rise thou therefore, get thee to thine own house, and when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die. And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found something good, toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord shall raise him up a king over Israel, 
who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam that day? But what, even now? For the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall root up Israel out of this good land, which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river, because they have made their groves, provoking the Lord to anger. And he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin, and who made Israel to sin. Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Tirzah. And when she came to the threshold of the door, the child died. And they buried him and all Israel mourned for him according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by the hand of his servant, Ahijah the prophet. The rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. And the days of Jeroboam, and the days which Jeroboam reigned were two and twenty years, and he slept with his fathers, and Nadab his son reigned in his stead. And Rehoboam the son of Solomon reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was forty and one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naama and Ammonites. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed, above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass in the fifth year, King Rehoboam, that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all, and he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And King Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shields and committed them into the hands of the chief of the guard, which kept the door of the king's house. And it was so when the king went into the house of the Lord that I that the guard bare them and brought them back into the guard chamber. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonites. And Abijam, his son, reigned in his stead. Praise God. Now, we talked about Jeroboam yesterday. And we brought out the fact that the moment he became king, he forgot the promise that God had made to him, that he was going to build him a sure house like he built for David. As though that was not enough for him to uh, rest on and walk with the Lord so that God's promises towards him will be fulfilled. But we saw in uh, the preceding chapter, chapter 13, uh, verse 26, 27, where he forgot what God told him in chapter 11, verse 38. Uh, and he decided it was best to keep the people of the 10 tribes that made up the 10, uh, the Northern Kingdom, keep them away from going to Jerusalem, to Shiloh to worship, because he was afraid if they went, their hearts might be turned towards Rehoboam, who is their Lord, which means he didn't even believe the word that the Lord gave him, that he was going to make him king and he was going to make him as sure as he made David's uh, lineage sure. And so that's what uh, made him take counsel and create two molten calves, set it up in Dan and Bethel, that the people should not bother to go to Jerusalem to worship. He reacted in fear and you cannot please God by reacting in fear. I don't care what the situation is. All right. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. It also says, anyone who must come to God must believe that God is. That is to say, God exists and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So you and I cannot react in fear to any situation that we find ourselves in. And the way to not give way to fear is to have knowledge and understanding of who you are. 
who you are, what you carry, who is with you 24-7. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I'm going to send the comforter. He will be with you to the end of the age. And I told you that over the years that I have walked with the Lord, I've taught myself how to practice the presence of God. I walk around with a super consciousness that the greater one lives on the inside of me. I have had someone pull a gun at me and I told him, shoot. I said, you'll be surprised that the, the trigger will jam. Shoot. He looked at me and he said, mad woman, and walked away. I said, who's mad, me or you? I have had a snake come into my bedroom just a meter away from me. I saw it coming. I didn't know where it was coming from. And it crawled under my bed. I was on the phone to my son, David, and I said, there's a snake in my room. There's a snake in my room. He said, mom, run out. I said, no. I need to know where it's going. Because if it gets lost in my house, I may not be able to live in that house anymore. At least until they find it. So I stayed there until animal rescue came. I've just shortened the whole uh, encounter. But I stood there and I, I, I wasn't afraid. I was more surprised because ever since I moved into that house, I have never cracked the window open one time because I don't like bugs. Never. How it came in, we will never know. But I learned a valuable lesson from that experience because when the guy who retrieved the snake came in, he had a long glove up to uh, the top of his arm like so. He picked it up by the tail. And I said to him, why would you pick up the snake by the tail? I thought you would have to pick it up by the head. But the way it was curled underneath my bed, he had to pick it up by the tail away from his body. And so when I asked him, I said, why did you do that? He said, once you take a snake from off the ground, it loses its orientation and it can no longer strike. I learned a valuable spiritual lesson from that. Not to fight Satan in my flesh. I will lose. I will take him away from where he's familiar, into the spirit realm, where I know that I am in charge because my father put me in charge. And I've never forgotten that lesson. Never forget what God has told you. You should write stuff down. Write them down. Put them where you can see them on a daily basis. If you cannot write them down, memorize them. Memorize scriptures. It will do you good. Right now, we are still able to buy Bibles and read Bibles and all the rest of it. Should the Lord tarry, I shudder to think what's going to happen. There are countries where you cannot own a Bible. Talk less of bring one out to read. Right? Don't forget the promises of God. They may look like they are tarrying, but they are not. He's a right on time God. He's never late and he's never too early. All right? So uh, Jeroboam forgot and lived any kind of way and he died. And in his stead, his son reigned. But before we get there, uh, his boy fell sick. So he said to his wife, Disguise yourself and go to the prophet that had prophesied to me that I'm going to be king. And go and ask him what we should do concerning the child. And why would Jeroboam say to his wife, disguise yourself? It's like when God came on the scene with Cain and Abel. And Cain had killed Abel and God said, Cain, where's your brother? Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? I don't know. And God said to him, if you do, if you had done well, you wouldn't have to hide. Basically, that's what God said to him. And if Jeroboam had done well, he wouldn't have had to tell his wife to disguise so that the prophet Ahijah wouldn't recognize her. He knew he had done evil in the sight of the Lord, and he had no right coming to God to ask God for anything. Certainly not for his son to be healed. So he sent his wife. He couldn't even come before God. Child of God, never, ever, 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 ever put yourself in a position where you come, cannot come before the Father. I don't care what you have done. You must always run to God, never away from him. Satan seeks to isolate. God doesn't isolate. God separates. 
They will separate you to teach you. He will separate you to discipline you. They will set, 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 uh, separate you to be able to put something in your hands that you can run with. But Satan isolates. Because when he isolates you, then he can still kill and destroy. He didn't have the temerity to come before God. So he sent his wife and he sent her to go disguised. But look at the spirit of God before she even stood in front of uh, Ahijah the prophet. The Holy Ghost had done spiritual gossip and told him, listen, that's Jeroboam's wife and she's going to lie and act like she's somebody else. And the moment she walked in, the man of God told her, why are you lying? There's nothing you can do about this situation because Jeroboam's sin had, had got into the highest heavens and God had judged him. His the kingdom was going to be rent from him and his son was going to die. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, notice, let me let me uh, mention that in verse 3. Uh, Jeroboam said to his wife, take 10 loaves, crack nails, fruits of honey with you. Don't appear before God empty-handed. And you certainly don't appear before a servant of God empty-handed. I'm not afraid to teach about money. I'm not afraid to talk about money because I don't depend on this ministry for my sustenance. I need to teach you for your own good so that you know. There was a time when I was poor, and I mean poor. I was on welfare. I got $356 every two weeks. That's $712 every month. My rent alone was $650. Not to talk about light, gas, common charges, because I lived in a condo. Um, and of course, I told you guys about my car called Mercy. <laughs> you heard me before you saw me. And I had three little children on my hands, 13, 10, and 4. With $712 a month, I was poor. But I tied, even out of that 712, I gave out of that 712. And today I can buy what I want, eat what I want, go where I want. God is not a man that he should lie. His word is true. Trouble with us is we think it's instant, like instant coffee. All right. Uh, God did take away the kingdom from him. Uh, and his son died. And I want you to notice a phrase going on uh, from this point on. Verse 16 says, He shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin, and who made Israel to sin. You will see that phrase over and over and over again as we go on. Because it is grievous for you to cause other people to sin. You cannot live your life in a way that encourages sin and encourages people, especially people who don't know the Lord too well, to walk in sin because they're looking at your life and they're saying, well, if a Christian can do that, well, it must be okay. Right? Child died. Child was buried. According to the word of the Lord. And the rest of the Acts of Jeroboam, the Bible tells us, we'll find again in the book of uh, the Kings, the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. Jeroboam reigned for only 22 years, slept with his fathers, and his other son reigned in his stead. Then the Bible switches to Rehoboam, who was king in the southern kingdom over Judah and Benjamin. He reigned 17 years. All right. The Bible switches to the reign of Rehoboam in the south, who was king over Judah and, and, and Benjamin. And the scriptures record that he did worse uh, than his fathers. He reigned for 17 years. Scripture is careful to tell us who his mother was so that we don't uh, mix him for someone else. He did not follow uh, Solomon, his father, or David, his grandfather. Scripture says he built images, groves, and every high hill under every green tree. He allowed the nations around Israel to influence him and the people of Israel. The Bible also says there were sodomites in the land and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord 
cast out before the children of God. Listen to me, child of God. You must not get insensitive to the point where you accept what is going on in this society. All right? Homosexuality is sin, period, end of story. Every perversion and deviant behavior concerning sex is an affront to who Almighty God is. There are two gifts that he has given us that makes us godlike, and I've talked about it. One in Psalms 82, verses 1 and 6, the Bible says God stands in the midst of the congregation of the gods. And if you were not sure who he was referring to, Asaph, who wrote the, um, the, the psalm, if you were not sure who he was referring to in verse 1, he made it very clear in verse 6. He said, ye are gods and the children of the Most High. So we must never become insensitive to these things that ought to vex our spirits. All right? Uh, society, government, they're pushing it. It's an agenda they're pushing. They're even pushing it towards our children. And it is sad that the church is quiet. All the ministers that have huge platforms and can wield influence, don't talk about it. Homosexuality is sin, period, end of story. Bestiality is sin, period, end of story. Every deviant behavior other than between a man and a woman as God ordained is sin. Trouble is the church hasn't handled the problem properly and that's why it has become what it has become. People who suffered from this situation were ridiculed, they were ostracized, they were shamed, they were thought to be weird, and so they hid. This practice has been in existence since Bible times. They hid because the church did not confront it as a spiritual problem that it is. Because those are spirits and they can be cast out of the individuals that suffer from the hands of the spirits. Period, end of story. All right? There were sodomites in the land and Rehoboam failed to get rid of them. Back in the day, it was, it was a question of annihilating them, killing them. I'm not advocating that now because now we know better by the spirit of God. Even in Saudi Arabia today, I'm told that they're still killed when they're caught. That's not the answer. It's a spiritual problem that requires spiritual solutions. All right? I'm going to leave it alone. But I cannot not talk about it. And so Rehoboam too did not do well at all. I'm looking for uh, other points that I want to bring out because there's not much uh, doctrinal issues that are in this. They're, they're just historical records of uh, these kings, how they ruled, whether they ruled righteously or they failed to rule righteously. All right. In verse 26, the Bible says he took away the treasures. The king of Egypt attacked him and took away the treasures of the house of God and of the king's house. Things that Solomon had taxed men grievously to build. The enemy came and took them away. And he had to replace those things with brass. And up until today, the people of God are exchanging gold for brass. You cannot compromise. You've got to walk with God based on God's commandments. You can't do what you like. You're not your own. The Bible says you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. That's what the scriptures say. All right. The rest of his acts, the Bible tells us, are written in the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. So we will encounter him again when we come to the book of First and Second Chronicles. The Bible also records that there was constant war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of their lives. Rehoboam slept in the Lord and he was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his son, Abijam, reigned in his stead. Any questions on chapter number 14? Before we go on. on.
Uh, Gloria, good morning. <laughs> good morning. You have made it so, the explanation is just so perfect. The Holy Spirit is working. I just want to acknowledge that you are doing a good job and God will continue to bless you. Thank you. My screen is frozen. Must be angry. <laughs> Hallelujah. Gloria, can you start over? What was your question? It was not a question. It's just an acknowledgement that you, your explanation is just to right on point. There's Thank no you. question. I'm just following and I'm enjoying it. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much. I think that's why the enemy is, is angry, <laughs> messing around with my Wi-Fi. <laughs> I have two, by the way. I have Xfinity and I have at and so, so I always have a choice. I just switched when, when it went off. Praise God forevermore. We will not be stopped. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Any other thoughts? Any other questions? Any other comments? Your own observation. Praise God. All right. If there are no comments, chapter 15. Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacha, the daughter of Abi Abai Shalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. Now the rest of the acts of Abijam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And there was war between Abijam and Jeroboam. And Abijam slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa, his son, reigned in his stead. And in the twentieth year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned over Asa, reigned Asa over Judah, beg your pardon. And forty and one years reigned he in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Maacha, the daughter of Abai Shalom. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. And also Maacha his mother, even her he removed from being queen, because she had made an idol in a grove. And Asa destroyed her idol and burnt it by the brook Kidron. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. And he brought in the things which his father had dedicated and the things which himself had dedicated into the house of the Lord, silver and gold and vessels. And there was war between Asa and Baasha king of Israel all their days. And Baasha king of Israel went up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might not suffer any to go out or come in to Asa king of Judah. Then Asa took all the silver and the gold that were left in the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and delivered them into the hand of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tabrimon, the son of Hezion, king of Syria that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There is a league between me and thee and between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent unto thee a present of silver and gold. Come and break thy league with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. So Ben-Hadad hearkened unto king Asa, and sent the captains of the hosts which he had against the cities of Israel, and smote Ajon, and Dan, and Abel Beth Maacha, and Seneroth, and all the land of Naphtali. And it came to pass, when Baasha heard thereof, 
that he left off building of Ramah and dwelt in Tirzah. Then King Asa made a proclamation throughout all Judah. None was exempted. And they took away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof, wherewith Baasha had built it. And King Asa built with them Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah. The rest of all the acts of Asa and all his might and all that he did and the cities which he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Nevertheless, in the time of his old age, he was deceased in his feet. And Asa slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his stead. And Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned over Israel two years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. And Baasha, the son of Ahijah, the, of the house of Issachar, conspired against him. And Baasha smote him at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, for Nabad, Nadab and all Israel laid siege to Gibbethon. Even in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, did Baasha slay him and reigned in his stead. And it came to pass when he reigned that he smote all the house of Jeroboam. He left not to Jeroboam any that breathed until he had destroyed him, according unto the saying of the Lord, which he spake by his servant, Ahijah the Shilonite. Because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned and which he made Israel to sin, by his provocation wherewith he provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. Now the rest of the acts of Nadab and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the King of Israel? And there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, began Baasha, the son of Ahijah, to reign over all Israel in Tirzah twenty and four years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. All right, this division that started after the death of Solomon, as the Lord had said, continues. And like I told you, continued even on to John chapter 4, when Jesus went to the well to see the woman at the well. You recall the woman was saying to Jesus, why are you speaking to me? First of all, I'm a woman. Second, I'm a Samaritan. I'm a woman of Samaria because the Samaritans had no dealings with the Jews. The division started after the death of Solomon with the reign of Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and it continued even down their different lineages. You see sons continuing the feud, um, grandsons continuing the feud, and it went on and on and on even until the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Um, in the 18th year of Jeroboam, um, son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. So even though Rehoboam had, di had died, Abijam, the grandson of Rehoboam, was now reigning while Jeroboam was still king over the northern kingdom. And Jeroboam continued the fight with the grandson of uh, Rehoboam. Okay? Um, the Bible records that three years that Abijam reigned in Jerusalem, his mother's name, the Bible tells us, he walked in the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as, as of David's heart. And uh, the Bible records that as God promised for David's sake, God did give him a lamp. God gave David a lamp in Jerusalem in that he allowed somebody from his lineage to continue to sit upon the throne. He did not altogether cast away David's uh, um, heritage. Okay. Um, verse 5 says, Because David did that which was right in his eyes, in the eyes of the Lord, he did not turn aside from everything God had commanded him to do, except for that one grave sin of adultery and mur murder, uh, really by proxy, because he sent Joab to execute the um, the death of Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. All right. 
um, I said the other day that God himself testifies that David is a man after his own heart. All right, what God meant by that or what the scriptures meant by that was the fact that David was a man who was constantly chasing after the heart of God, constantly wanting to do right. It's like what Apostle Paul said in, I think it's 1 Corinthians. Either 1 Corinthians or Romans 5. Let me check so I can give you the right, um, the right reference. Paul said, when I want to do right, I find out I cannot do right because of the sin nature that's in me. Let me see if I can find it. Romans chapter 7, not 5. Romans 7. Come there quickly. Paul says in verse... Let's go back to verse... Let's go back to 7 so that it can make sense. Chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say that then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known loss, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. See, the fact that God says not to do something, the flesh wants to do it. Galatians 5, 17. The flesh lost after the spirit and the spirit lost after the flesh. What the flesh wants to do, the spirit doesn't want to do. And what the spirit wants to do, the flesh doesn't want to do. This is what Paul is explaining again to the church in Rome. He said, but sin taking occasion by that commandment, the commandment to not lust, sin takes advantage of that commandment and wants to do the exact opposite. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, the sin is dead. Without the law, sin is dead. If the law didn't say thou shalt not steal, then my flesh won't want to steal. Because I wouldn't know to steal or not to steal. He says in verse 9, for I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin became revived in me and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. All right. Jump down to verse 15. He says, that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. That's King James English. Basically what Paul is saying is, what I want to do, I find out that I cannot do it. Because of the law of sin in my flesh. And so if you continue to sin, child of God, you are operating under the law. And grace no longer covers you. That's just the truth. Read it again. That which I want to do. I'm paraphrasing it. Verse 15. I am not able to do. I allow not. That that I should do. That I don't do. But what I hate is what I do. If I do that which I don't want to do. I indirectly consent to the law that the law is good because the law commands that I not do those things. Now it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. You cannot operate by the flesh, child of God. For to will is present. I want to do what's right because I know what's right, having been born of the Spirit. I know I want to do it to will is present with me, but how to do it is what I cannot find the strength to do. Why? Because I'm operating under the law and not under grace. I told you grace is power to walk away from sin. Grace is not there to cover sin. God will not be mocked. He says for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, in my flesh, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of the sin 
which is in my members. It's very simple. This is why I teach that you can live above sin. You can, absolutely 100%. All right? He says, oh, wretched man that I am. That's my flesh. My flesh is wretched. He already told me in verse 18, there is no good thing in my flesh. So I cannot listen to my flesh. Dead men don't talk. So my body cannot tell me what to do. It must be in subjection to my spirit, which is the real me. That's what animates this body. That's what allows this body to see, to walk, to talk, to eat, to drive, to do whatever it does. Once I come out of it in what we call death, once I come out of this body, it's going to drop to the ground lifeless because it has no life in it. I, my spirit man, is the one that makes it alive. Therefore, it cannot tell me what to do. I was saying to you the two most powerful gifts that God gave to man and to angels, even though he restricted one of them with angels, is the gift of choice. Self-will. That's what makes us godlike. Of all the creatures that God made, we're the only ones that can tell God no. And he cannot do anything about it. And then the second one is the gift and the power of procreation. That's restricted in angels because the angels that went to start sleeping with the daughters of men in Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says he rounded them up, bound them in everlasting chains of darkness, awaiting judgment. But those are the two most powerful gifts that he has given us and they are the ones that are most abused by children of God that are ignorant of who they are. All right? Back in uh, in First Kings. David lived right before God. His heart constantly chased after God. In Psalm 42, he says, As the deer pants after the water brooks, so pants my soul after God. He uses, he uses a physiological need that we have to express how important it is to seek after God and follow after God. It's not a casual thing. Christianity is not meant for the weak. And it's not for yo-yo believers, up today, down tomorrow, up today, down tomorrow. No. Apostle Paul said, the things that happened to me happened for the furtherance of the gospel. So it doesn't matter what the enemy throws at me. I just get more stubborn and I get more resilient. I'm the chief stubborn officer of this fellowship. Praise God forevermore because I will not quit. I will not back down. I will not withdraw. I will not re retreat. I will not stop until Jesus comes. Amen. Bible says there was constant war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. And even after Rehoboam's death, Jeroboam continues the fight with his descendants. Abijam dies. He's buried in the city of David with his fathers. Uh, and uh, Asa reigned over Judah in his stead. The Bible records that Asa was a good king and it was someone who walked with and feared God. So, child of God, in the midst of the depravity of this society, you can still live right. Guard your eye gates. Guard your ear gates. One man of God said, you cannot sin without your eyes and your hand. And Jesus Christ said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Better to enter into the kingdom maimed than to go to hell with all of your body. That's what the Bible says. And he will never tell us to do something he has not graced us with the ability to do. James said, you are tempted when you are enticed. Let no man say, God tempted me. God tempts no man. You choose to act on your own will. Okay? Asa lived 
in the midst of all of that nonsense and all that the kings before him did. He didn't continue. He created a revolution. He got rid of everything. The Bible says he reigned 40 and one years in Jerusalem. The Bible even says his mother's grove and her gods he destroyed. The Bible says, now know we no man after the flesh. I hope someone is helping me with scriptures. They're coming to me. I may not remember the reference. I need somebody to be a scribe to look them up and put them on the chat so everybody can see it. Now know we no man after the flesh. If my mom, my father, my brother, my sister, my son, my daughter is going to cause me to sin, I will disassociate myself from them. It's as simple as ABC. His mom, he took away the sodomites from the land. He removed all the idols that his fathers had made. I'm in verse 12 of chapter 15. All right. He removed his mother from being queen. He dethroned her. And her idol and her grove that she had built, he destroyed and he burnt with fire by the brook Hidron. That's his mom. And if you are the mother of a son, you know how sons feel about their mother, their mothers. They feel very protective over them. They will do literally anything for their moms. But he didn't, he didn't cater to that sentiment. All right. That, but he made the mistake of leaving the high places. He didn't remove them. Although his own heart was perfect with the Lord all the days of his life. All right. He brought the things which his father had dedicated and the things which he himself had dedicated into the house of the Lord, vessels of silver and of gold. And there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, who had succeeded Jeroboam because that enmity continued. Went up to Judah, built Ramah. He was, you know, making incursions into the southern kingdom so that he will not allow anybody to come in or go out to Asa, the king of Judah. So Asa, in his wisdom, went to Ben-Hadad, who had had a relationship with his father, and, and sought for an alliance and, and help. And Ben-Hadad came and helped him. Okay? He was able to take Ramah back, and then he built additional cities. And the Bible tells us the rest of his acts is to be found in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. Asa slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his stead. Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, uh, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, the king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel two years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, walked in the way of his father, and in the sin of his father, wherewith he made Israel to sin. God kept referring to Jeroboam's sin, the two golden calves that he made and he put in Bethel and Dan remained a perpetual affront and sin before God because it continued to influence the reign of the subsequent kings in the Northern Kingdom. Uh, Basha slay was the one who killed Asa, king of Judah, verse 28. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Basha slay, yeah, slew uh, the son of Ahijah, the house of Issachar. All right. He smote them at Gibbeton, which belonged to the Philistines, laid siege on them. Uh, and while he reigned, he smote all the house of Jeroboam. He left not to Jeroboam any that breathed until he had destroyed him because God had said he would destroy every male. Scripture puts it in a funny man, in a funny way. Everyone that pisseth against the wall. <laughs> so God got rid of all the males. All right. Because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned and which he made Israel to sin. That's that phrase again. By provocation wherewith he provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. And then the rest of the acts of Nadab and all he did are also recorded in Chronicles. And there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all of their days. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, 
began Bashar the son of Ahijah to reign over all of Israel. And he reigned for 20 and four years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin, wherewith he made Israel to sin. Listen, if you say I'm born again, I'm going to heaven, and you continue in sin, you lie. Apostle Paul says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Don't think God is a fool. He will judge sin, both in believers who continue in sin and in unbelievers. The Bible says we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's not for the unbelievers. That's for the believers. It's called the Bema seat of Christ. And we will be judged by everything we did in the flesh. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Nobody in the church is teaching or talking about sin. I will. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Where are you? Thank you, Holy Ghost. This is Paul writing. I'm going to read from verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry and ye are God's building. He's talking to believers. He's not talking to unbelievers. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, Paul, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another build it thereon. But let every man, including you, let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. You are the one building on the foundation that Apostle Paul has laid and that I am building on as well. Paul says, I have laid the foundation and another, in this instance, Pastor Mo, in I believe Bible Fellowship, and another buildeth thereon. But then there's the part that you are building as well. He says, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, verse 12. If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work, all of us, all believers, shall be made manifest. It will be exposed. That's the meaning of manifest. For the day shall declare it, that's the day of judgment, appearance before the beamer seat of Christ, for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work, you and I, what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man seemeth among you to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may, the, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness unto God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. We will all be judged. So don't be fooled. I'm back in the book of Kings. Any thoughts, any questions on chapter 15? Thank you, Lord God. Sister Gloria. It's so good to, to read that um, what Asa did, which Abijam did not do. I think they have the same mother. Um, I would have to go back and look it over. I cannot definitely say yes. In, in verse 2, his mother's name was Maacha, the grandmother of Abishalom. The same thing for, for Esa, 10, and he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. His grandmother's name was Maacha, the granddaughter of Abishalom. Okay, it must be the same person. You're mm. correct. 
So he must have seen what the, the, the line of Abijam going astray and decided to even stop her from being the queen mother. Mm -hmm. we, and his heart was right with God. God That's bless true. his heart. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for that observation. Anybody else? Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, you know, how God remained, you know, faithful to David, you know, generation after generation, letting his sons and grandsons, you know, the generations after him to continue ruling. And then I was wondering why or how Isa or Asa was able to discern, you know, good versus evil and destroying all the bad things that his ancestors had done before him and, you know, living like David. Because it looked like there was no one in the society at a time where he was living to, you know. Um, the, sim the simplest answer I can give you to that question is that his heart followed after God. If you walk with God, he will direct your paths. He will teach you what to do. You know, he said, if we seek him, we'll find him. So Asa must have been someone who sought the Lord. Uh, possibly everything that he witnessed around him vexed his spirit. And he was thankful not to go that way. And, and that's how it ought to be for us in the world today. You, you put on the television and, and in five minutes you want to put it off. Uh, you get on social media and in, in, in a couple of minutes you want to put it off because there's always something there that should vex your spirit. So I think a simple answer was the fact that his heart was perfect towards God. Mm -hmm. You know, more than, we, more than we want to be led, God wants to lead us. And if we turn to him wholly, as, as in W-H-O-L-L-Y, he will lead us. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning, customer. Good morning, Kalisa. How are you? I'm fine. So, um, considering the fact that the Northern Kingdom um, eventually all disappeared, nobody can actually give um, account of where they are today. So, the Israel we know today, even though it has been watered down by movements, by marriages and all that, would be the 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 the, the southern kingdom made up of Judah and um, Benjamin. That would be accurate. Okay. Because the ten northern kingdom are lost. <clears throat> and I, I've seen a couple of guys on YouTube saying they've been found. Mm -mm. They've, either, <laughs> they've either been subsumed by the societies that they mix with or they've all died off. We don't know. We, but we do know that they are lost. The Bible tells us yeah. that they are. Yeah. Um, another thing that I, I want to mention based off of what you just said, God not only had a covenant with the people, he has a covenant with the land itself. And so all of these people that are, that are around today and still troubling Israel, is because of the failure of the of of the man of God to fulfill God's instructions. God told them to totally annihilate those people, but Joshua failed to do that, and subsequent leaders failed to do that. Yeah. If you don't get rid of stuff in your life, it's going to come back and bite you in the behind. That's why you cannot tolerate sin, not for one one second, one nanosecond. The moment the Spirit of God brings it to your attention, you repent and you walk away from it. I told you, as long as we're in the flesh, we will sin because the flesh is hopeless. But to continue in sin, that's another level. But to make excuses for sin. Pastor Mo, another thing I wanted to observe, um, but let me know, I don't know if it's an observation, but I need your input. <laughs> is the, the the southern kingdom that did remain and there were the people that exiled and there were the people that um, 
returned in, in 1948. Now, my, my observation or my question is this. They, looking at the Israel of then and the Israel of now, genealogically and um, biologically, there has been a lot of intermarriages in their movements. <clears throat> so they don't, they're not even like, the pure breed that that left in exile anymore. <laughs> Truth be told, there's nobody of none of us that's pure breed. It's true. Even you that you are talking, who is to say that there's not some Jewish blood in you? You are Igbo. And they found Jewish artifacts where you are from. Yes. So who is not to say one million generations away, one Jewish guy didn't have a hand in who you are? <laughs> right? right. It's true. We're all mixed. Like yesterday, you told me I'm a mutt, and I said yes. <laughs> I, I totally agree. I am a mutt. <laughs> yeah, right. You're yeah, right. But the covenant still stands. Anyway. The covenant still stands, and God knows who is who. Yeah. And then the covenant with the land hasn't changed. <laughs> So it doesn't matter who is dwelling on the land. God has a covenant with that that re piece of real estate called Israel. It's not the little strip you and I know to be Israel today that's Israel. It's actually Solomon's reign went clear up to Lebanon. Mm -hmm. All the way down to Ethiopia. And back then Ethiopia spread into West Africa. I have that old map. Where all of Ethiopia started from West Africa. Going towards East Africa. Okay. Yeah, so, the reason why I was asking that question is because some people seem to have the problem with, oh, why, why people? Um, I've um, heard of, I've heard all of. You've that. heard of that, right? Yeah. Uh, after I, all, it's not even the, the Israel of the old. Uh, da, 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 they are Zion, and they are not the Israel of the Bible and so on. Mm. God knows His own. Period. End of story. Yes. God knows those that are His. And if he made a covenant with Israel, that covenant still stands. So there are Israelites that are the descendants of Abraham. There are. Regardless of intermarriage and, and migration and whatnot, there are those that are still direct descendants of Abraham. And then in the New Testament, God throws a spanner in the works. He says, you, me, somebody from Poland, somebody from Czechoslovakia, somebody from Russia, that says, well, also, yeah. also spiritual Jews. Because in Christ Jesus, I'm a seed of Abraham. Yes. <laughs> so. It's true. Yeah. They're just splitting hair. They're just splitting hair. God's word will come to pass, regardless of what any man has to say. Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, do we have time for one more chapter? We have 15 minutes. And chapter 16 is do 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 do. It's 23 verses. Do you have time? Or should we call it a day? Let me know. You guys want to take one more? I can't speak one. for me. I know. I I'm I'm game. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys. Do you want to call it a day? We got time. There you go. Okay. Chapter 16, verse 23. And the Lord said to Samuel, no, chapter 15. I beg your pardon. Where am I? I'm sorry. I left First Kings. Thank you, Holy Ghost. It's so much fun to hang out with the Holy Ghost. Chapter 16 has 34 verses. All right, let's do it. Then the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha, saying, For as much as I exalted thee out of the dust, and made thee prince over my people Israel, and thou hast walked in the way of Jeroboam, and hast made my people Israel to sin, to provoke me to anger with their sins, behold, I will take away the posterity of Baasha 
and the posterity of his house. And I will make thy house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Him that dieth of Baasha in the city shall the dogs eat. And him that died of his in the fields shall the fowls of the air eat. Now the rest of the acts of Baasha and what he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? So Baasha slept with his father and was buried in Tirzah, and Elah, his son, reigned in his stead. And also by the hand of the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, came the word of the Lord against Baasha and against his house, even for all the evil that he did in the sight of the Lord, in provoking him to anger, and the work of his hands in being like the house of Jeroboam, and because he killed him. And in the twenty and sixth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Elah, the son of Baasha, to reign over Israel in Tirzah two years. And his servant Zimri, captain of half his chariots, conspired against him as he was in Tirzah, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, steward of his house in Tirzah. And Zimri went in and smote him and killed him in the twenty and seventh year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his stead. And it came to pass, when he began to reign, as soon as he had sat on his throne, that he slew all the house of Baasha, and left him not one that pisseth against the wall, neither of his kinsfolks nor of his friends. Thus did Zimri destroy all the house of Baasha, according to the word of the Lord which he spake against Baasha by Jehu the prophet. For all the sins of Baasha and the sins of Elah his son, by which they sinned and by which they made Israel to sin, in provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities, now the rest of the acts of Elah and all that he did. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the King of Israel? In the twentieth, in the twenty and seventh year of Asa, king of Judah, did Zimri reign even seven days in Tirzah. And the people were encamped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. And the people that were encamped, encamped heard Zimri say, Hath Zimri hath conspired and hath also slain the king, wherefore all Israel made Omri, the captain of the host, king over Israel in the day in the camp. And Omri went up from Gib Gibbethon and all Israel with him, and they besieged Tirzah. And it came to pass when Zimri saw that the city was taken, that he went into the palace of the king's house and burnt the king's house over him with fire and died. For his sins which he sinned in doing evil in the sight of the Lord, in walking in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sin which he did to make Israel to sin. Now the rest of the acts of Zimri and his treason that he wrought, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? Then when the people of Israel divided into two parts, half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Genath, to make him king, and half followed Omri, but the people that followed Omri prevailed against the people that followed Tibni, the son of Ginnath, and Tibni died, and Omri reigned. In the thirty and first year of Asa, king of Judah, began Omri to reign over Israel. Twelve years, six years, he reigned in Tirzah, and he bought the hill Samaria of Shema for two talents of silver, and built on the hill and called the name of the city which he built after the name of Shema, owner of the hill, Samaria. But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord, and did worse than all that were before him. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam the son of Debat, and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin, to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Now the rest of the acts of Omri, which he did, and his might that he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab his son reigned in his stead. And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa king of Judah began Ahab the son of Omri to reign over Israel. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all, that were before him. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the, the daughter of Eth Baal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. 
and he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than the kings of Israel that were before him. In his days did Hiel, the Beth, Bethelite, build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abiram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his young son, Zigob, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by none, by Joshua, the son of Nun. All right. Nothing much here other than um, historical uh, records of how the kingdom continued to split. Uh, Asa sat over Judah for 40 and one years. But during that time, the northern kingdom split several times uh, and had several kings rule and reign over them. All of them had very negative reports uh, about themselves. None of them walked with God. And now we are introduced to Ahab, whom we will read about uh, in the next couple of chapters and his encounter with um, with uh, Elijah, the Tishbite. We will pick that up tomorrow. Very interesting uh, um, passages of scriptures coming up uh, from tomorrow. Uh, I want to uh, bring out a point in verse 34. The Bible says, in the days of Hea, Ahab, Heel, the Bethelite, built Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abiram, his firstborn. That is to say, when he laid the foundation of the city, his firstborn, Abiram, died. And when he finished building and set up the gates uh, of the city wall, his youngest son, Zigob, according to the word of God, through Joshua, also died. I want to call your attention to Joshua 6, 26, because that's where that is recorded. And I want us to look at it. Joshua cursed that city when they came against Jericho. Uh, in verse 26 of chapter 6, the book of Joshua, the Bible says, and Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. We see that happening here, just as Joshua has said. That's why, child of God, you cannot open your mouth and just say what you like. Words are powerful. Words were designed by God to create. My famous example, if I say blue waters, white sand, gentle breeze, coconut trees, umbrellas, what comes to your mind? I'm sure it's a beach. I never said the word beach, but I painted a picture with my words and your imagination was able to capture it because words can and do create. You have to be careful what you say about yourself, about your children, about your spouse, about your business, about your life. Oh, stupid me. Why would I want to call myself stupid? Or silly? Or call myself an idiot? Why would I want to say such things about myself? Yet we say those things casually and we are not mindful of the full import of what it is that we're saying. Joshua said it, and it happened exactly as he said it. All right? Not only that, if you apply the principles of types and shadows, and I've taught that, certain truths that God could not reveal, he would teach it by that principle of what Bible scholars call types and shadows. Uh, Joshua is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, his name is the Hebrew version of, of, of Jesus, Jehoshua. All right? God the Father laid the foundation of your new life in Christ by the death of his firstborn son, Jesus Christ. He set up the gates. He finished your life by the death of his lastborn son, Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father. So you have to be careful the things that you say about yourself, about your life, about your walk, about your business, about your family. Only speak God's words, regardless of what you see. It doesn't matter what's going on. 
word of God is able to change any situation whatsoever. All right. Questions, comments, observations. Uh, my main observation was that, you know, Isa was able to maintain his rule for over 40 years. Because when we read, it's measuring the reign of the northern kings and like the reign of, you know, Isa's reign, where it's like, oh, in the, you know, 12, 27th year of Isa, this person ruled. And it just goes to show how the other kings were not able to you know, maintain rain because they went, they completely went against God, like the next person was after the other. But um, the only, I think the only reason why Isa stopped raining was, you know, he got to the time, you know, old age, and then his son took after him. But mm -hmm. with the Northern Kings, it was just their behavior, right. their, you know, the evil things that they were doing, how they completely got worse. Did you ever get to a time where it got better or was the northern, you know, side just abolished completely? They just they just got lost. Mm. Like I said, they were either subsumed by the uh, peoples that they mixed with and completely lost their identity or they all died off. We don't know, but we just know that they are lost. Mm. God said, with long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. If you walk with the Lord, he will He will uh, preserve you. But when you begin to walk in sin, you expose yourself to all kinds of uh, crazy stuff that is liable to happen. So you're quite right. It was because he followed hard up to God that God preserved his reign and gave him a long, uh, a long life. Also, Anyone my else? other question, just sorry. Go on. You know how they talk about the years, you know, in the Bible. Is that the same as like, you know, the 12 months we have now? Or was it like a different measurement back then? Because I'm assuming that when they do years, it might be longer in Bible times as opposed to now where we count by 12 months. No, I think a year is actually a year. Um, I don't think it was shorter. Um the start of their year is different from the start of our year because we're using different calendars. But it's the same mm -hmm. talk. Okay. Anyone else? Any comments? Yeah, my observation or comment is just piggybacking into what she just said, uh, what your response to her. It just shows what was, what was happening in the Northern Kingdom just shows what happens in our lives outside of Christ. It's just a lot of crisis from one crisis onto another, from one onto an, another. And it, it, it reminds me of what um, Reverend uh, Cynthia said, preached upon a long time ago about the six feet, you know? You just continue to deviate from God six feet at a time, and then it gets worse every six feet you, every further six feet you go away from the center and that's just what was going through my mind as as I'm looking at how different king, different kings came followed after what was happening and when six feet further away another one comes follows up six feet further away and the southern kingdom stayed strong under the one leadership because they were following after God's ways. It just that is so um so revealing to me this morning. Praise God. Praise God. We'll follow hard after God. Thank you, Lord. All right. Uh, we can bring our study to a close now. It's a little past eleven. God is faithful, and we thank Him for His goodness towards us. Heavenly Father, thank you for Your Word. Thank you for the power that it has to change us and to mold us more into the likeness and the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege of being able to break down the word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, our blessed teacher. Thank you that we live in a nation where we can congregate and we can still break the bread of life. 
Father, we do not take all these things for granted. We are truly grateful. Thank you for this fellowship. Thank you for what you are doing in us, with us, and through us. And to you be all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. Again, let me bring to your remembrance our mission trip scheduled for the 14th to the 28th of July, 2024. We will be uh, leaving the U.S. on the 10th to arrive in Ghana on the 11th. Guys, you have no idea what God is doing. <laughs> Yesterday, God brought someone who not only knows what to do with medical missions, has actually been on medical missions, and she said she's coming with us. That is a huge load off my chest because I, I did not know how I was going to coordinate it. I did not know how I was going to do it, but I knew that's one thing we needed to do. Two of the villages that we have adopted and we're going back to, we cannot go back there and give them the water purification kits. We already gave them those in October of last year. So as I was praying, asking the Lord how we can minister to them, the Lord said uh, a crusade and a medical missions would be great. So it will be a left-right combination of punches, a left hook medical missions, and a, a right cross to knock the enemy out the crusade. <laughs> Praise God. So not only are we doing it practically, we're bringing the spiritual side of it as well. And this lady uh, is going to help with the, the medicines that we need, uh, procurement, what we need to buy, how to organize it, how to, I mean, I am just beside myself with gratitude to God. Uh, we're going to be holding some meetings going forward so that we can uh, make more concrete plans. God does answer prayers, period, end of story. And so I want you to continue to pray for us. Uh, we're going to be laying the foundation of our belief chapel at Secheran Sutra village. We are going to take possession of the land for the school that the Nana of the other village has promised us. Uh, we're not going to be able to do anything with it other than for me to commission for it to be surveyed and get the architects to design a school block. That's all we're going to be able to do. And I think next time we'll go, then we can talk about laying the foundation for a school block. Um, yeah. So I've been working, I've been up since about 5.30 this morning, putting stuff together. I'm going to put a post on our Telegram chat uh, for those who are going so that you know exactly line by line, precept upon precept, what is happening. I'm grateful to God for all the help and assistance he has given us thus far. Uh, I wanna encourage you to sponsor a well. It's $800 for one well. If you cannot afford $800, you can co-sponsor. Get eight people to give you uh, $100 and you got a well. And you can name the well. All right, name it, after, name it after your favorite Bible character or your grandma or your grandpa or your son or you get to name the well, all right? Um, eight people can give you $100 each. Four people can give you $200 each. Uh, two people can give you $400 each. And you're there. So please give and give generously. Um, if you are still mindful to go, the entire trip uh, for a little over two weeks, two weeks and four days, will cost you, in my estimation, $3,500. And I am a frugal person. Okay. Uh, that will be your flight ticket to and from uh, the U.S. If you buy now, because we found someone who's getting tickets for us for just under $1,500. The last time I checked, uh, United Airlines was, was talking $2,200. So it's going up the closer we get to the date and the closer we get into summer months. So if you're mindful to go, I'm sure this lady can still work her magic for you, um, hopefully. Uh, so $3,500 will buy your return ticket, will give you spending money, 
and we'll also give you hotel accommodation. I've already made reservations for us at a very good hotel. It's a place that I can stay in. And if I can stay there, you certainly can. I'm mindful of my responsibilities. Um, I think if you share a room, it comes out to be like $80 a night. Um, and that's pretty reasonable. So go to God. Don't limit God to your little paycheck. Tell him, I want to go, Lord. Make provisions for me. You can raise funds by yourself. If you need for us to give you a letter to authenticate what you're going to tell whomever you're going to ask for uh, funds from, we will write you a letter that you're part of the uh, missions team and that they, they should um, please give to you uh, generously so that you can participate in that exercise. All right. Uh, Jay, do we have any other announcements beside that? That's all we have. I'll post a way to give in the chat now. Okay. The last well that we sunk in a village called Nungwa, uh, close to the border of Ivory Coast, I couldn't wait to commission the well. So we will be going to Nungwa, which is at the border of Ivory Coast. Uh, to go and commission that well and hand it over to the locals. I'm sure they would have started using it anyway because there's no restriction on it. On, on it. It's on the church grounds. Um, and I told them to allow the villagers to have access to it. I do believe it's, a, it's an excellent bait to get them into the church. If they come to fetch water there, uh, we, can, we can get them to come into the church. And if they are not saved, we can get them to become saved. Um, so we will be going to Nungwa. Uh, the last time we went there, we walked across the border. I told the Lord, I said, I wanted to go into Ivory Coast and take possession of the land. And so we walked across the border into Ivory Coast. And I said to the Lord, you said everywhere the soles of my feet tread upon, you will give it to me for an everlasting possession. So we, we, we hope and we believe that God will open the doors of Ivory Coast to us in the near future to be able to go there as well. These are exciting times to live for God. All right. God told us whenever we come together to put Job 5.12 upon our lips and not to be complacent, but to speak against what we see going on in our society. Our food is being tampered with. Our water is being tampered with. The weather is being tampered with. The land that grows our food, they're tampering with it and putting all kinds of stuff just to be able to uh, reap bumper crops and turn a buck. All right, we can't even eat, uh, uh, you know, organic foods anymore. And even the one that they say is organic, I found some of them to be a lie. It's not organic, they just put it on it. Uh, and then if indeed it is organic, they price it beyond your reach, which is ridiculous. So we need to start to pray. We cannot be complacent and we cannot sit on the fence. Job 5.12, God caused it to be written more than 6,000 years ago. It has not diminished in strength. And when we put it upon our lips and speak it out in faith, it will go where we send it to, and it will prosper where we send it to. So, Father, we thank you for the power that's in your written word, but more so in your spoken word. We put Job 5.12 upon our lips and we speak to the north. We say, Father... You disappoint the devices God of the disappoints the devices of the crafty so that they are hard and perform, perform their enterprise. enterprise. Father, to the south, we say, you disappoint God disappoints the devices of the crafty so that they are hard and perform, perform their enterprise. enterprise. Father, there's child trafficking, there's sex trafficking, there are women that are held in bondage for sex. There are all kinds of crazy things that are going on. We employ the east wind of God, even the wind of destruction. We command it to blow, to destroy every installation, destroy every laboratory, destroy every farm and field, destroy everything that is working contrary to the will of God. You said the earth is yours and the fullness thereof. Man has no right to do what is doing to the earth that grows our food. Therefore, Lord, to the east we say, God, 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 God,
And finally, to the West, we say, God Thus you caused it to be written, Father. Thus we have spoken, and thus it shall be done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 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 Tomorrow, tomorrow is Friday, and we are going to pray. This is a praying ministry. Prayer is the place where you root out, you pull out, you throw down, and you destroy. Prayer is the place where you exercise the dominion the Father has given to you. Prayer is the place where you tell Satan, thus far and no more. So I want to encourage you to come. I do believe uh, the prayer points have been posted. I want to encourage you to volunteer to pray. Don't leave it to the same persons who pray Friday after Friday after Friday. They are getting better at the craft of praying, and you are not. No one is going to laugh at you. No one is going to say your prayer is not effective. It's the heart that counts. All right? Volunteer to pray. Go there and pick a prayer point and tell the uh, leaders of that ministry that you want to pray and come and pray. Even if it's a minute, it's a starting point to learn how to pray effectively. And there's no telling what it will do to your faith when you pray and you see direct answers to prayers that you have offered to God is going to boost your faith. I promise you 100%. So come ready to pray. Come ready to take authority over the kingdom of darkness. Come ready to establish that which he has promised you. Every delay, every seeming denial, every distraction, come and take authority over those things so that the will of God can be done in your life. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.